have been slowly, very, very slowly, <laughs> trying to take the steps to lay the foundation of just very basic, I, would, I really don't want to get into the details, which we'll do later once we've laid the foundation of the teaching of the lost tribes, which dovetails into other things prophetically, without which, by the way, if individuals are not taking the time to take note of this, without properly understanding who these individuals are and that they will become two separate, referred to two separate peoples, uh, both those who are considered, quote unquote, lost and those who are not so lost, uh, house of Israel and house of Judah. It is impossible to understand scripture if you don't get the historical record of the north and the south, just as first and second kings and first and second chronicles are the record of the north and the south. Without understanding the difference between Israel and Judah, people will bring all kinds of error and craziness into the Bible. Now, with that being said, I told you the catalyst for this. Um, don't forget, we eventually will end up back in Revelation and prophecy in between. But this is actually a needful foundation for understanding what happened to some of these people who later, by the way, in Revelation 7, were told 12,000 out of each tribe, save the mention of one or particularly one or two, depending on how you count. Uh, preachers of righteousness, which is kind of interesting. I have my own little sidebar on that eventually we'll get to. The land that is promised and apportioned in the prophetic passages of Ezekiel, future time. And things that must be taken hold of in order to understand the rest of Scripture. So we started looking at uh, the children, the sons of Jacob, who obviously gets his name changed to Israel. So each time I do this, I will, for the sake of those who are listening for the first time, act as though you didn't hear the rest of what I said and the messages that came before. So when I reference the sons of Israel or the children of Israel, I am referring to those born from Jacob, Jacob and his two wives and their concubines. So the whole house of Israel born from four different women, and these will make up what are referred to as the tribes of Israel. Now, we first started looking at Reuben, who, because of the law of primogenitor, the law of the firstborn, he should have inherited the blessings. And the blessings is like a whole package. Think of it as, you know, when you go to buy a car and you got everything in it, it's the whole package, right? He should have gotten the whole package, but because of something he did, which we taught on a few messages back, defiling his father's bed with, uh, in an incestuous and adulterous uh, relationship that he had, forfeits that package. And to the second and third sons, Simeon and Levi, who we looked at, who in vengeance, because their sister was raped by a man, taken advantage of, even though he wanted to marry the sister, they went and basically tricked the men of that city into circumcising themselves. And while they were in a sore state, they took advantage of that to slaughter all the men, take the material goods out of the city, including women and children. This angered Jacob because they didn't consult with him. And Simeon then is kind of skipped over uh, in the blessings, he really doesn't get a blessing. Um, strangely enough, Levi doesn't receive a blessing either, but Levi will become an important, integral part of the history of these people. Out of the tribe of Levi will come Moses and Aaron. And again, this is all very interesting if you follow these people. They don't get any land allotment promised to them but they get the right to live in 48 different cities peppered throughout the north and the south. As war will begin to break out, the first, when I re reference war, I'm talking about the, to the north, Assyrian captivity or the carrying away, some of those priests will actually, or Levites will actually defect to the south. 
So there's some transition. But when we talk about people being carried away, I still want you to think that these 48 cities peppered through the north and the south, for the benefit of those who were not watching last week, and certainly for the benefit of those who are listening on radio, uh, the map. <laughs> Great visual for radio people. South and north. North Israel, south Judah. There were priests peppered throughout. When the Assyrians came, some that were closest to the northern part of the southern portion defected and crossed over into Judah. In any event, what you're going to have is people uh, being carried away. Two different periods, two different times. Um, and actually, I'm referring to them as two events, but there are several events in between. The Assyrian carrying away and the Babylonian, which will occur later. And perhaps there are waves in each of these. They didn't just happen all at once. But the final one is obviously of the Babylonian captivity, of which the people of the south are finally carried away. What is important is there are people who either by ignorance or by willing, willingness to rewrite history, uh, prefacing the Bible as some uh, fantasy. They want to make it sound as though the people who were carried away um, are lost forever. And that's a gross mistake. Um, as I said, there's some interesting things that should be considered. Levi, that technically wasn't really considered exactly a tribe and they had no land inheritance. Interestingly enough, in the book of Revelation will be part summoned 12,000 out of the tribe of Levi to be preachers of righteousness. And these were the original, if you will, instructors of the law and of God's word. So when you think about how God is weaving something, it's important to understand all of these small pieces. I know there's lots of people that say, oh, come on, I don't need the details. Oh, yes, you do. You absolutely do, and I do too. We all need the details. It's I, just for the benefit of those who are undisciplined in your listening skills, I suggest that you start honing them. And forgive me for just saying it like this, but there's nothing worse than listening, trying to listen, or trying to, for those of us who are trying to, it, yours truly will remain a student of the Bible until I have no, no more breath left in my lungs, but trying to, to take in and I'm, if I'm having a discussion or if I'm even in a diatribe and you cannot harness your mind long enough to take in, sure, you're going to have questions and you're going to have things that come into your mind even while I'm speaking. Jot them down on a piece of paper. Meditate on them later words, but, you know, afterwards. But don't let your mind stray because it's impossible to take in information and be that buzzing around in your mind. Dr. Scott used to call it wool gathering. I'm, I'm beginning to find a lot of people I encounter who have no listening skills. They have never been told that it takes discipline to listen and to pay attention. Uh, you've heard me m reference many times the study of Ralph Nichols at the University of uh, Minnesota who perfected that department it's the first and only of its kind. I'm not even sure, that, by the way, in this day and age if it still exists, but back then it was um, very unique because why? We teach people to read and to write. We do not teach people to listen. How unfortunate. So I'm asking you to, even if there's repetition here and things that you've already heard, just harness your brain long enough. You might pick up some new things or refresh your mind on some old things. Now, with that being said, um, when I said the whole birthright package, eventually will get split. As we know, of all the sons of Jacob, who is Israel, the one son who he loved from his favorite wife, Joseph, is sold away into uh, slavery by his brothers who hated him. And it is essentially the half-Egyptian children of Joseph that he produces while he's, he rises to the highest level right under Pharaoh in Egypt, saves his brethren as a famine hits. Uh, he's given a wife to marry there, has sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who Jacob slash Israel 
we'll say he's taken to himself in place of essentially the firstborn that essentially failed him. He's going to take them so that they will take his name, that is Jacob, to himself. And the birthright package will now be essentially split. So we've got blessings. Instead of it being one package going to one person, the package will be split. And it's split between the sons of Joseph, those half Egyptian children, Ephraim and Manasseh, and the line of Judah, the line, not lion, eventually will be called the lion of Judah. But I ask you to consider something um, because I'm going to look at a story we've looked at before, and it's somewhat strange that I've said not one of these people, save Joseph and perhaps maybe one other, but not one of these children of Israel had great uh, morals or values. They all did something that's rather disturbing. This, uh, what we're going to look at today is, uh, is all about Judah. But before we go to the passage that talks about what he did, I want us to look at the blessing that is bestowed upon him. That blessing, we'll find that in Genesis 49. And what I want us to always consider, there's multiple levels of things to consider here. That is, we often read about these people and we elevate them to some special status. And although, of course, they have special status, they're in God's book, we often take the humanity away from them. We make them into something they're not. They were just like us, which should be a great, blessing to all those people who think they've just messed up way too bad to receive any good gift from God. By the way, if you're listening to me and you're still listening, the good gift you've received is the greatest gift of all, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. Genesis 49, Jacob called unto his sons, said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. And of course, we have Reuben, which is not really a blessing. Uh, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. I've told you that's a poor translation. Unstable or turbulent as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. Next in line, and they're just globbed together, not even separately. Simeon and Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitation. O oh, my soul, come not into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And just remember, this is so important to remember, this dividing and scattering, especially for Levi, who will have no assigned territory of the 48 cities allotted. Think of it already as scattered. Even though they will serve the Lord and they will, the sons of Levi, three specific sons branching into eight will become the priests and the Levites who attend to the most sacred and holy things but scattered in the sense first and foremost throughout the north and the south in the 48 cities. And secondarily, what will happen to these people, much like what will be foretold of the prophet Hosea when he talks about Jezreel scattered. Now, don't think for a minute that God doesn't have the ability to know where these people are. If he had the ability to say what will befall them and give some great prophecies, that along the way, some of them have been fulfilled and some we are yet waiting for the fulfillment. Believe me, he knows where these people are. And then we come to Judah. Judah, by the way, whose name means in he from the Hebrew praise. And each one of these names actually means something. If you go back to Reuben, Reuben has the Hebrew word for sight in it, uh, Simeon to hear, Levi's to be joined together. And Judah, from the Hebrew word to praise, from which also later we will get the term Jew. 
and where people often fall off of a cliff is they assume that all of these people were Jews and there were no such thing as Jews up until this point or they assume that Moses, Abraham, Moses were Jews but there was no reference to Jews until the kingdom divided after the death of Solomon. That's much later and we have to be clear that in its initial use it was to refer to the people of Judah. So just be, be aware that these terms get tossed around and if you read any of the old time books a lot of times there's a lot of confusion between Jews used as a homogenized term which can be very confusing. That's why I said you need to know the difference between Israel and Judah. Now Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. So praise, your brethren shall praise you. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. And by the way, the lion will become the national emblem later on in the standard and the banners that are created in Numbers 2-2 around the camps. Each tribe will have a standard or a banner that they, they raise up. The lion will be part of the emblem. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? And here is, so there's many things that I, I don't want to get into the details because the details will come out later once we have the foundation. But here's the most important part of this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So immediately we have the right to rule, the scepter, this Hebrew word for rod, royalty or ruling shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver. So two things are being put down here, the, the giving of the law or the keeping of the law and the right to rule from between his feet until Shiloh come. And many Bible commentators have issue with this because they do not feel that it could represent the prophetic picture of the coming Messiah, but unfortunately if you do not understand or view it that way, you're going to have a hard time trying to figure out what on earth that means. Until Shiloh come, and until him shall the gathering of the people be. Vining his foal unto the vine, and his ass is colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And you might say, well, that's kind of a strange blessing. You know, Shouldn't it be like you're going to have plenty of land and plenty of children? But you get the point that in between here, the blessing being split up, Judah now receives this scepter, right to rule, and lawgiver status. So we see that the package has been split up and Judah gets it. The question of the ages, and I'm sorry, this is the way my brain processes everything. The question of the ages is considering Judah's history, it's a very strange thing why it should have been bestowed. You might say, well, this is the order. If Simeon and Levi are passed over, if Reuben is passed over and Simeon and Levi are passed over, then it should go to Judah. But Judah doesn't have a very pristine history. Now let this be, forgive me, and let me just insert this. Let, let this be a lesson to all of those people, self-righteous, hypocritical, lack of understanding about God's ways. God will use the base things. He will use the things that are, and all things, by the way, are ruined and marred just like the clay in the potter's hand. This is why I serve and stay here serving and love the Lord so much. I recognize something. Thank God that God brought me to hear Dr. Scott in the day that he did, that I could hear Dr. Scott say, send me all the sinners in town and that I didn't come to a place where I heard someone who was so self-righteous and so self-absorbed with their own perfection that it left me scratching my head asking if I could ever make it in, and that's not the case. The case is that the grace of God extends to every person who will look unto the Savior knowing they need to be saved. The greatest miracle, I've told you, is not a harlot, a whore, a drug, druggy getting saved, the miracle of salvation when it's truly a miracle is usually by the Pharisees. If the Pharisee can get saved, that's a miracle. So don't bring your stuff in here. This is a place where everybody knows what stock they came from, 
where their destiny ultimately would be if it had not been for God tugging and leading you to the right place. And let these people be the template to illustrate that God will always reach down and find the most broken, most vulnerable. And it doesn't mean that the starting point is there exactly the way you and I would envision it, but it gives me great hope that if God will deal with these and bless these, what he will do for those who recognize who he is in this moment right now. So the background to Judah, of course, is in Genesis 38. All of that was to set the stage for us to go there and read. And I've done this before. Uh, so it's, it should be somewhat familiar to us. And I guess while you're turning to Genesis 38, I want to say one thing. I don't really, I want to read about Judah because I want us to have it clear in our minds for those people who have no frame of reference. And believe me, I get your messages and I've read them and this is why I'm going that slow. About 80% of the congregation has been here and her teaching like this for many, many years, but there's about 20% who are left clueless when I make references to something they have no idea. So for the benefit of the 20% and for the benefit of those who need the review, that's what we're doing right now. All right, Genesis 38. It came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her, and he went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son. Now just remember in the backdrop of all of this, that once he has a son, technically speaking, this son, firstborn, should become a ruler. This firstborn would have reigned Jump over a little bit, after the death of Joseph. I know I'm bouncing between things, because Joseph will be carried away into Egypt, by, sold into slavery by his brothers. He'll rise up to a high place. He'll become the most powerful, powerful man. Then he'll die, and the scripture records, there rose up a king, a pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And after that, it should have been a firstborn of Judah to rule. This is the order of things. This is the one thing I think I've not said before. If the people were carried away over 400 years, now they weren't carried away over 400 years. They were in Egypt. They sojourned, slash, became slaves, slash, for over 400 years, four plus generations. And they were not slaves during that time, but Joseph only lived for 110 years. That means that a portion of that time, the children of Israel were living in the land and they were not yet slaves until this king rose up who knew not Joseph. So you've got a, a good span of time to do some math. There had to be some other rulers there ruling the people, the children of Israel, while they were in Egypt. If that makes any sense to you, I hope it does. If not, you'll hear me repeat it again. So. Judah, the same Judah we we're just talking about, who's receiving the blessing out of whom, who's loins such notables as David and Solomon, and eventually the line to Christ will, that will come. But this is the beginning. He goes into a woman named Shua, bare a son, called his name Ur. That's number one. She conceived again, bare a son, she called his name Onan. That's second son. She conceived again bear a son, call his name Sheila. What a bad name for a guy. Three. <laughs> and he was at Shezib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So this should have been the first ruler after the death of of Joseph, but it says he was so wicked the Lord slew him. Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife, marry her, raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. It came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore the Lord slew him also. 
Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, the third one, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto sheep shears at Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And he was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law go up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And we know that's not all he did there. She put on her widow's, she took off her widow's garments from off her, covered her with a veil, wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which is by the way in Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and he'd, Sheila was not given to her to produce children. When Judah saw her, that is now Tamar, when he saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she'd covered her face. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And I love this because it just shows you the, the, the greatness, the greatness and the thought. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou also give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand. Give me your ring. And the, the, the ring is always the symbol to identify the family, to identify the head of a family. Bracelets and the staff is always the symbol of power for the head of the family as well. And he gave it to her, came in unto her, and she conceived by him. She arose and went away, and laid her veil from her, put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. He asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? They said, There's no harlot in this place. Ha ha. <laughs> and he returned to Judah, said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, thou hast not found her. It came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. A nice family situation. <laughs> and when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet, the bracelets, and staff. Does it look familiar to you? <laughs> Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not Sheila my son, and he knew, knew her no more again. Well, the, obviously, it, it says, suffices to say she did not get uh, burned, because it says, It comes to pass in the time of her travail. Behold, twins were in her womb. It came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand. The midwife took and bound upon his hand the scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. Now remember, Chronicle, that the three sons now are out of the picture. So the next in line to take hold of the promises of right to rule and lawgiver will come out of these children, one of these children, of the two that are in the womb. Midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. It came to pass as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez, which is meaning breach. And afterward came, upon, came out his brother with a scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So Zerah is the firstborn, Pharez the second. And why is this relevant. This is relevant because, again, you've got to jump all over the map then to start piecing these things together to find out that sometimes the details we need are not spelt out crystal clear and in sequence. We went from the birth of these children straightway to uh, Joseph and back into Joseph's life and Joseph's history. You've got to go somewhere else to find the history of these children to see what happened to them. So if you, if you follow the history, 
first going to second, I'm sorry, first chronicles, second chapter. Remember I told you I'm not going to go too crazy on you as I'm trying to lay a foundation. I want to make a point. The message will be very simple. First Chronicles, second chapter. And there's a recap, right, beginning the second chapter in the first verse. These are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, and Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These are the three we just read about. Which three were born unto him of the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess. And Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him. And Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bare him Pharez and Zerah. And if you look at the spelling, you'll see it will change as you go through the book. This record, by the way, is important because if you study the genealogy, is especially the opening of Matthew's gospel records this particular line of Pharaoh's leading us to Pharaoh's line, leading us to from David to Solomon to Christ. Now, let me just pause there for a second. This is why I tell you, God's concern with the details. This child with these children were conceived in a sneaky way, not in an honorable way, but neither was the father honorable. Now, it turns out that he says she was more righteous than I, but my point is, this is the beginning of a whole family that, as I said, will rule, will spread out, and people who are not looking for the evidence of where these people are will automatically assume that the promise given at a later time to David out of the mouth of Nathan, and then reiterated by the prophet Jeremiah regarding an everlasting seed being on the throne. And people will automatically say, well, of course it points directly to Christ, but it's speaking about something, that promise, that is still being fulfilled today. And there are many kooky people who take a little bit of truth. It only takes a little bit of Truth coupled with a lot of wackiness to have people spin out into orbit and create all kinds of fantasy ideas or for people to completely lose their faith like Payne and others who said God did not make good on his promises, therefore it's all a lie. You've got to look at the evidence. So here it says here, all the sons of Judah, there were five. The sons of Pharez, Hezron and Hamul, the sons of Zerah, Zimri, and if you have a Bible like mine, the margin will say Zabdi, and Ethan, Heman, Ch Chalcol, which is also sometimes Chalcol, and Dara, which is at times Darda, and also at other times referenced by another name, which I will refer to perhaps today. Five of them in all. Now what's important? How do we, what do we know about these people just mentioned, specifically about Calcol and Dara or Darda? Well, we know this. There's another reference, if you want to turn there, in 1 Kings, in the fourth chapter. And it is basically promoting how great the wisdom of Solomon, the greatness of his wisdom, of the gift of his wisdom, 1 Kings in the fourth chapter, and I'll just jump in there at verse 29. I hear the page is still turning, so I'll wait. 1 Kings 4, if you have a Bible like mine, it's page 463. If you don't have a Bible like mine, you're going to end up in another book. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much, largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Now there's this mention right here. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, than Heman, Chalcol, and Darda the sons of Meho. Now what's interesting is you wouldn't know this unless you were studying the reference to 
Chalco, which is Calco, and Darda, which is Dara, from the passages I just read, that these are referencing the, essentially they're saying that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the last line of the kings of the Zara line. And they're in there, it's just not random names being mentioned, these names are in there, and unless you know the histories of these people, you wouldn't know that Chalcol and Darda are part of the Zarahite Judah ruler line. Now there was a bifurcation, I need to say this for people that might seem to be a little bit lost. There was a bifurcation between Pharaohs and Zerah. If you turn back briefly, if you can go back to 1 Chronicles 2, they took the time, the chronicler took the time to chronicle the difference between the Pharaoh's line and the Zerah line. And interestingly enough, further on in 1 Chronicles 4th chapter, we've got a detail. The sons of Judah, Pharaoh's, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobal. And that line continues on. Now what is the point of this being put in here? The point is that there will be a bifurcation of sorts, as I said, between Pharaoh's and Zara's line. And the Zarahite rule that would have essentially taken over at the death of Joseph, when Joseph died in the land of Egypt, there were people ruling. We don't have that chronicle here. All we have is the length of Joseph's life, 110 years, and we assume, we assume this, that the death of Joseph and the raising up of a pharaoh who knew not Joseph are simultaneous or they are uh, concurrent with each other, but not necessarily so. And especially if you're familiar, which I don't want to get into the details of this because it's pretty detailed to go down this pathway. And people are not in agreement as to the lines, if you understand the different dynasties and the different dynastic periods within Egypt. Not everyone is aligned up in agreement in what period and which pharaoh, and we have a hard enough time for people trying to figure out who was the pharaoh of the Exodus when Moses left. But if one is willing to look, there's enough information to show that before the Exodus of Moses, there were at least one and possibly two other exoduses out of Egypt. And these records carry with them the record of this seed of the Zara rule. Now we know that the Pharaoh's rule didn't just disappear over the horizon. Why? Because it's recorded and given us the lineage right down to Christ. So we have a perspective of that line not disappearing anywhere. We know where it went. But the Zara line, which would have been, remember, firstborn, who would have been ruling which, as I said, not recorded, but if you go, if, you're, if a person is so inclined to do, you will find uh, people who wrote history, ancient recorders of history, both Greek and Egyptian. Certainly, Diodorus Siculus was one of them, um, who recorded people's foreigners who were who actually left the land, and he's referring to Egypt, and these people essentially show up in places such as Greece or referred to by him as Argos and the Argai. And there becomes this a little bit of confusion. So when we're looking at the second chronicle, first chronicles, second chapter, the names Calcol and Dara or Darda, we know that and we can trace from these historians um, Chalco fled to Greece, founded Athens, Darda to Troad, or the Trojans. You can kind of trace. And then there are the sons. There's the offspring of these people. And there is a migration. Now, I'm, just, I'm putting this out here right now because for some of you it is a review. For others, you're going to hear this for the first time. You're going to say, what did she say? Because people have a, they get trapped in some of the mythological histories of the formation of places like Greece. Hercules, by the way, um, people talk about the mythological perspectives, but if you are familiar with the development of the history of what is now the mythological person of 
Hercules, you would know about Herculeum. And Herculeum is the same as those people being referred to as wanderers or nomads, which will appear in that land. And there's a whole history that I could go into, but I don't want to lose you. The son of Chalcol or Chalcol, whose name is Gathalus or Gathalus, returns to Egypt, then on to Spain, and we have a whole founding of areas that will reflect the names of people, places that are basically drawing us back to uh, the roots of the sons of Israel slash Jacob. This begins, you begin to see, uh, it's almost like th the word Zara, which is seed or to scatter, and Jezreel, to scatter being fulfilled in the peoples who begin to, before Moses even leaves, before Moses is even born, there is an exodus out of Egypt led by these. Now, what's important? What should I leave you with to make sure that you're not going, uh-huh? Uh, there are various historians, as I said. Herodotus tells us of ships that made stops at Rhodes before continuing on. A uh, temple was founded by the daughter of Danus, who we'll talk about when we get to the tribe of Dan and the scattering of the peoples, uh, like a serpent leaving a trail across the face of the planet, founding all the places where you can find the Din, Dan. Remember Hebrew, no vowels, right? So D and N, anything that's got a D and an N, Macedonia, Sardinia, Scandinavia, you're going to find a lot of those peoples with the word Din, Dan, or Don within it, essentially making their way, inhabiting the earth, bringing their customs and cultures with them. And no, don't look for people practicing Judaism. This is the mistake of people saying, well, these people surely practiced certain things. In the course of time, unless you were an individual living and practicing your faith, and let's talk about that southern portion, Judah, as the last ones being carried away into Babylonian captivity. If you remember when I taught the decree of Cyrus out of Second Chronicles for the people to return, in Ezra and Nehemiah's book, they had trouble finding people who could even speak the language and very few who understood the customs who were able to read the language. And that's in a short period of time. So imagine what would go on over the course nomadically over the course of a span of years now going on hundreds of years. Look, we have, a, we have a difficulty in our own civilization. Our own culture is changing the history of this country. You know, whether you, you may not like, I've said every, every place has something that they'd say they'd rather not have had happen. Slavery in this country and the history of slavery is a terrible thing. And people getting you know, crazy about the flag, stars and bars, and take it down, and take down statues of generals who were supportive of slavery. But you're, you're taking away the history. And it's part of the history. It's part of what is wrong with our society now, is if it's unpleasant, we want to remove it. Instead of saying, this is part of where we came from. This is part of who we are. And part of never repeating again is not living and camping out, but never forgetting it, and making sure that the next generation understands and is educated. But in this day and age, I'm going back now to the Bible, and living the life of nomads, even if they had memory traces of certain customs, they would begin to be very faint memories. And what you're going to be left with are traces of names of people. As I said, the uh, son of Chalco who travels off to Spain, who will plant many different names, the Iberian Peninsula related to tracing, it back, tracing its name back to Eber and Hebrew, and places that will be planted, Zaragoza with the name Zaran. You're going to see names popping up where it will bring us connectively like a word uh, the word game, you know, to connect the dots with the word, but that's about it. The peoples themselves may have practiced certain customs and maintained certain customs, but by and large, the bulk of it, if they ever did practice it, gone. People have gotten frustrated saying, well, we're looking for uh, people who practice Judaism. 
But let me go back and say that Judah and those people who were later referred to as Jews were the southern kingdom. And the first carrying away that I'm referring to, which we'll talk about in messages to come, has to do with the northern kingdom. The carrying, the taking of the people by the Assyrians. And if you read the apocryphal books, specifically Tobit talks about how he bought and sold. He did certain things for the king. They were free men. They were moved around. And people talk about how and where they, they were moved around. Think of it this way. Think of anything that is going north and over the mountains. These people traveled far distances, some by ship, some by land. You know, the mystery, I've said this before. I don't want to talk too much about Dan because Dan will make up a good part of this. But the mystery of Dan is that his territory, if you look on the map, is right by the water. And I'm not only convinced by scripture, the book of Judges talks about Deborah's song about Dan dwelling in ships. I'm perfectly convinced that these people had perfected the art of shipbuilding and perhaps their knowledge became what is spread out, we tend to attribute to the Phoenicians, people of the sea. So there's, when we talk about people who are lost, these people are not lost. And anybody who says they're lost, I told you this uh, program that I watched, which is supposedly a secrets of the Bible, you know, they're going to tell you the secret there. No, all they did was tell me that they're really demon possessed because anybody who's, anybody who's really looking for the evidence is going to find a few things that are quite staggering. And that is that these people, you know, a whole body of people disappear over here and reappear somewhere else. And there's a whole history of this. Impossible that God couldn't possibly know where these people, there's no record, by the way, of a mass uh, massacre of these people. Furthermore, if you go into the book of Maccabees, uh, Maccabees 1, and I believe it's 12. You've got the king of the Lacedaemonians writing a letter saying, they're, they're essentially Greeks, writing a letter saying, we are the stock of Abraham. We come from Abraham. But you'd have to look for those pieces of information to realize that God basically had his people set up. And then the great debate is, well, if God gave this promise back there to Judah, and some other thing needs to happen, and that is the line of Pharaohs and Zara need to be reunited, which, you know, if I were going to lead you through the whole history of the wanderings of the people, you'd end up with the prophecy of Ezekiel talking about the tender twig, which is referring to King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah's daughter, being taken by Jeremiah off to a land and essentially, the two lines become one and merge again down the road, now history for us. And if people are willing to look, you can keep seeing that there is a seed even today of that line that's been united. Until he comes, that promise must be kept, still ruling today somewhere in the world. Now, if you're, you know, if you're a student of the lost tribes and you're a student knowing this and you know who it is and if you don't then you'll have to come back <laughs> but <laughs> and I'm not done I'm not done the point I want to make today because I'm trying to lay down the information without being on overload the point is when you see people this I go back digress to this program where they had people practicing uh, circumcision and uh, dietary kosher laws. And they track the travels of these people who essentially left at a certain time. They built a new city, Zion, before embarking and traveling deep into Africa. The problem is that when they talk about these being the lost tribes, they're mistaken about something. The idea in this program was to say that these people were carried away in Babylonian captivity and rather than going back to rebuild, these people left and went their way. Let me tell you something. The problem with that, there may have been some people who actually migrated. But most of the people who were carried away into Babylonian captivity, 
The numbers that returned were very few. We know they're recorded in Chronicles for us. But why didn't they go back? They could have rebuilt. They could have helped. Why? Because they had enough time had passed. Seventy years was prophesied by the prophet. Seventy years is enough time to produce children and have roots in a place and not move again. And this is, for the most part, what happened to those people. Now, that's a whole interesting study. If you want to follow the uh, practices of those people that ended up in that place and follow that, that's an interesting study. But they, for the most part, did not migrate as the northern people did who were actually moved and transported around the areas going over the Caucasus and Lake Van and other parts that we have a record of and then kept migrating. And those who left by ship and who kept migrating. So n don't confuse the two. Understand the difference be between the two of them. The other thing I want to say before I wrap this up is that if God can manage to give a prophecy, to give a blessing of a prophecy to an undeserving one, if God can manage to sort all this out and make it come to pass as thus far, remember he said to Judah, the scepter shall not depart. And we jump through. If somebody was just reading before David became king, you'd say, but wait a minute. Saul was king before David was. That's right, but Saul wasn't of God's choosing. Even though he said, if they want a king, I'll give him one. It was David that was of the choosing in his line and his seed. So if God can figure and sort all that out and find some kid who is the youngest of the family out there tending sheep who doesn't look like a king but fits the bill in perfect coordination with being the seed of that line that then produces another child. I believe Solomon is his ninth child of all the children he produced. I may be mistaken there. But a little bit down the pipeline to produce the one that will take the throne and for the last time in the united kingdom of Israel and Judah before the kingdoms bifurcate. And then you'll have a whole series of kings and rulers, respectively north and south, until the carrying away. Now, how could God work all of this out in the details, friends? I said, the details are important. Somebody who's not interested will just say, yeah, they disappeared, they're gone, and they're going to start looking for somebody in some country somewhere who is wearing a yarmulke, practicing circumcision, and, and keeping the kashrut laws. And I listen, I have no problem with the spread of Judaism, but I have a problem with insinuating that these are the people who are the descendants of, when in fact, when we begin to look, we're going to find that the people who we think are descendants of, we probably wouldn't make the connection. In my culture, you know, it's better for us to believe mythologically about the founding, for example, of Rome than it is to follow the, the, the lines to trace the origins. And you find out that these people, peoples that begin to be spread, are the same peoples who will found great cities, as I said, such as Greece, and begin to be populous, dense people, which brings me back to something that God said to Abraham when he said, father of many nations, seed, but father of many nations. You know, if you begin to look at this book beyond the basic things, beyond the simple, and you start scratching and you go deep, you find it, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to say someone sat down and fabricated or they took the time and license when you begin to see the detail of God making things come to pass. Now, as for Judah, I don't know why God, some have interpreted the blessing in Genesis 49 when it speaks about the blood of grapes as though he repented to his father and had a right attitude. I don't know exactly, I'm going to be honest with you, there's times when I can say I don't know exactly what the intent of those few verses are, if they are to be understood that way or if they're to be understood about the cleansing, referring to the one who comes who is able to cleanse. But I can tell you this, God bestowed a blessing and began to make good on it until the coming of Christ and until he comes again. And in that framework, it's important for us to separate the north and the south, to understand 
the concept of rulership, right to rule, the one who is still, there is still one reigning on earth today. We're not, I'm not speaking of Christ. Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, King of kings. We're talking about on a throne sitting today. And those are subjects that if we're willing to take a look, you'll find a whole universe, a labyrinth of don't get sucked in and disappear, as I've said. This is the danger. You can get sucked into this and <gasps> all of a sudden you've, you've lost track of the Bible. But if you're willing to look, you know, I, I think one of the things I, I just touched on basically is Jeremiah's taking the daughter of Zedekiah. Actually, there were, there were two daughters. And you'll find the, a place that is named at some point Ur, which becomes Ir, which becomes Eri. And we trace all of these names, by the way, are back to who is the person we were looking at, son of Ur, of, of the line of Ur, Ur, the firstborn of Judah. And then there's another Ur, which is referenced in the secondary line in the Chronicles, First Chronicles and 4 regarding Ur. You'll find that all of these traces bring you back to something where God is saying, I'm in control. And when I call my 12,000, preachers of righteousness out of the respective tribes I've named. And when the land is dispersed and allotted, as Ezekiel 48 chronicles, God will know where to find his chosen ones. Don't, get, don't go off on some deep mystical la-la land. Look for the facts here in the book. And I hope you leave today with, you know, maybe I didn't give you a word that uh, said, hey, you're... Your sickness today is gone, or you're, you're feeling a little bit better. I want, but I want you to know something. If God can work on the details as, as distinct as they are, then he can work on your personal problems. He can fix your health. He can take care of the issues with the same trusting fidelity that if he's in God of the details, he's also God of the details of your life as well. I've got much more to say on this subject, but I think I've said enough for today. I hope you'll come back, and we'll keep doing this in uh, increments until it all gets dinned in properly, but that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.